Hey, it's Ramsey Dewey over here in Shanghai, China. Welcome to another edition of Q&A with the Coach. Today, we have a question from Luis Enrique Timoteo Pesua. He says, I've trained in modern Wushu, Sanda, and modern Taolu, which is Kung Fu forms, for over six years. Aikido for five months, Taekwondo, World Taekwondo Federation, and Hapkido for two years, and Judo for a year. The sport which I've spent the best years of all this training was Sanda. I've competed in many small tournaments inside my city, and you could check a small video in my channel. Okay, cool. Maybe I'll check that out. My point is, why Sanda is not popular in America, or in my country, or any other part of the world? People always ask me, is Sanda similar to Muay Thai? There are a lot of shirts about UFC or Muay Thai, but no Sanda t-shirts. My question for you, Ramsey, is what would we need for Sanda to become popular? More movies focused on Sanda. An MMA fighter who only uses Sanda. I don't know. Please, Ramsey, give us your opinions. Sanda is my favorite sport. I'm not competing anymore, but I still work out, and that makes me happy. Okay, I, I love Sanda. Sanda is a fantastic martial art. It's a fantastic combat sport. I have lived in China for 11 years. And there we go. I've lived in China for the last 11 years. I currently live in Shanghai, China. And when I first came to China, I was super excited about finding somewhere to train Sanda. And I was super disappointed that it is not very popular here in the People's Republic of China. Just to give you a few numbers, China has 1.3 billion people and approximately 10,000 total people in the entire country who practice Sanda. 10,000 might seem like a big number, but per capita, that's, that's nothing. That's a tiny fraction of people. There are probably more people in China who play Pokemon, probably by a significant margin. There are probably more people in China who, who do, I don't know, curling. Not, not this type of curling. I'm talking about the Olympic winter sport where they, they brush the ice with a broom and then push this little thing over the ice trying to get in in a certain place. It's an obscure, weird sport, but it's in the Winter Olympics. There are probably more people in China who do that than Sunda. And that may be surprising because isn't that the national Chinese combat sport? It is, and it kind of isn't. It is on paper, right? Sunda is awesome. If you're not familiar with the sport, it's basically Chinese kickboxing with throws and takedowns. You score points by kicking your opponent, by punching them, and by throwing them on the ground while you remain standing. It's fun. I've competed professionally in Sanda here in China. I fought a few Chinese national Sanda champs, really, really tough guys. I've trained with uh, a few different Sanda teams um, throughout the country, in Shandong province, in Jiangsu, in Xi'an. You know, it's fantastic. I listened to an interview um, last night with Chinese UFC champion Zhang Weili, and the interviewer asked her about her experience with Sanda, and she said she hadn't heard of it for most of her life until, until later on, until she was like in her 20s, I believe. And she, she had practiced Kung Fu as a child, uh, different Kung Fu forms and all this, she had this idea, I want to learn Kung Fu because it looks cool in, in the movies, basically. And it wasn't until later in life that she heard of Sanda for the first time. She'd lived in China her whole life and didn't even know what it was. Weird, right? Except it's not that weird because it's not that common. It's not that popular. Do you remember when Muay Thai was unknown in the United States and throughout most of the world outside of Thailand? Do you remember that? Why did Americans start to learn about Muay Thai? I'll tell you. I think it was Jean-Claude Van Damme. I believe it was. In his movies, especially the movie Kickboxer, my first exposure to Muay Thai was in the movies. And I actually did see a movie where there was a reference to Muay Thai, though they didn't really show anything about it before that, but my first real exposure where I started paying attention, what is this Muay Thai thing? What is this? What is Thailand? Where is Thailand? 
until I saw the movie Kickboxer with Jean-Claude Van Damme. Quick recap of the movie, Jean-Claude Van Damme's fictional character, forget his name, and his older brother, uh, they are they are like American kickboxing champions or something like that. And then a uh, huge Thai fighter from Thailand named Tong Po fights this dude and paralyzes Jean-Claude Van Damme's brother. And... Um, you know, he just brutally beats him up in the ring. And they're like, we've never seen anything like this before. He's clinching. He's throwing knees. He's throwing elbows. Ah, this is crazy. And so it's it's really played up like Muay Thai is this totally badass, destructive, almost like no rules type of fighting system. And Jean-Claude Van Damme, he goes to Thailand, trains under a master of Muay Thai, does a bunch of helicopter kicks, which is something you will probably never see in a professional Muay Thai fight, and manages to... Avenge his brother. It's an awesome movie. It's got its flaws, but, you know, it's, it's awesome. It's great. I love it. And I think largely due to that movie and some other Jean-Claude Van Damme movies where, where he talks about training in Muay Thai and Muay Thai is the solution. You know, like the, the Quest, that's another one. The Quest, where Jean-Claude Van Damme, he goes to, what did they call it? They called it like Muay Thai Island. He goes to Muay Thai Island. I think they literally called it that in the movie. And trains in Muay Thai. And then he uses his Thai boxing and his helicopter kicks to, to save, to um, not save the day, but uh, win the tournament at the end. Because of movies like that, Americans saw that and we... We respond to action heroes. We respond to popular action heroes. And Jean-Claude Van Damme was the it man at the moment. The it guy. He was the action hero of, of the time. And so we responded to it. Bruce Lee was... Um, ahead of his time in his understanding of the influence that media has on the average person. He understood that when people look at a movie and they see somebody's head, they see a movie star's face as big as a building hovering over them, it seems more important than it really should be. When we see George Clooney or Brad Pitt's face towering larger than life, suddenly we attribute great importance to them. This guy's important. He's a movie star. He's not just a guy. He's huge. A lot of people are surprised when they, they meet me in person, like uh, people who watch my YouTube channel, because they're surprised that I'm much bigger in person than they expected me to be, because they're usually watching me on a tiny little screen on their phones or, or a small screen on a laptop or something like that. And so they, they look up like, you're a lot bigger than I expected. And movie stars often have the opposite experience. I've read a number of accounts of movie stars who were saddened to learn that their, uh, their real-life encounters with people were disappointing because they weren't these giant demigods. In fact, they were normal people. A lot of people are shocked to learn that Sylvester Stallone is not a giant, tall man. He's more average-sized, for example. After watching, you know, Rocky looking up at him like this, like, whoa, look at Rocky. He's so big and majestic. He's so fast and dreamy. So, yeah, movies have a profound effect on us. And Bruce Lee understood that. He wanted to share a message about his philosophy. And so he made every attempt he possibly could. Every time he appeared on a TV show like Long Street, he started pontificating about his, his Jeet Kune Do philosophy, interjecting that as much as he could because he understood people seeing him on a screen would idolize what they saw, for better or for worse. If Bruce Lee was alive today, how would he use the internet? Would he use the internet? A lot of old media stars, if you will, a lot of old media moguls are kind of terrified of the internet because it challenges you know, that big screen, larger than life demigod persona that it creates for their stars and allows average people like you and me to pick up their phones and film themselves in a room with a screen behind them and 
have thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of people listen to them, and suddenly, you know, YouTube fame is born. But this was a question about Sanda, not fame, right? But why isn't Sanda popular? And why Muay Thai is? Why Muay Thai is because of movies, for the most part. And then, I mean, there were some challenge matches, early challenge matches. You can watch them today, like... Um, Man, what was his name? Um, Rick Rufus. I was thinking Duke, but no, it was Rick. Rick Rufus fought. Was it Kamo van Kiat Sangrit? No, 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 no. It was um, Chiang Mai. I, I'm blanking on the dude's name. I believe it was Kiat Sangrit, one of those guys. Anyway, he had this fight between a, a Muay Thai champion. Somebody correct me in the comments. Those Thai names are very long, polysyllabic, difficult to remember. Anyway, Rick in this. Uh, this Muay Thai champion, go at it. He gets his leg just kicked to death. He falls out, down, down on the mat. Rick has to be carried off in a stretcher. And this shocks the world because America had never seen this before. We'd never really seen leg kicks. They were legal in that form of American kickboxing under that specific rule set, but nobody was doing them. And that surprised people like, whoa, there's this whole other thing over on the other side of the world. My friend Mike Stidham, uh, he hosted one of the longest-running um, MMA shows outside of the UFC, the Ultimate Combat Experience. Put on that show every single week for a very long time. Put on hundreds of episodes. And before he was doing that, like way back in the day, he was a Taekwondo guy. He was a kickboxing guy. I believe he was a national champion in the U.S. at one point. And he had one of those fights. He was like the real-life version of... Uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme's character in that movie. We had a fight between, um, with, with a, a Thai fighter and kind of got his butt kicked. And it was shocking. People were like, but, but he's such a good American kickboxer and he's getting his butt kicked by this guy we've never heard of with this style we've never heard of. And there were a number of fights like that that got people's attention and started, people started becoming of the opinion, Muay Thai is great, Muay Thai is awesome, we, we need to do more of this. And when the UFC started, Muay Thai was the go-to striking art that they went to. And so that, you know, the mere exposure effect is very powerful. When you repeat something enough times, we simply accept it as true. And so the idea was, you know, boxing, wrestling, Muay Thai, Jiu-Jitsu. If you do those things, you'll be a well-rounded fighter. And sure, those are great skill sets to have. Are they the only skill sets to have? No, obviously not. Sunda is awesome. It's great. And one thing it does really well that Muay Thai does not is the focus on stand-up grappling, on throws and takedowns, on the quick wrestling. There are throws and sweeps and takedowns and stuff in Muay Thai, but it's, it's not as emphasized as Sunda. And at the same time, the clinch fighting the beautiful intricacies of clinch fighting and finding the homes for the elbows and the knees and all of this stuff is not emphasized in Sanda like it is in Muay Thai. And so both arts are beautiful and special in, in their own right. And, and I love them both for, for different reasons. How would you make Sanda more popular throughout the world? I think you would probably have to start by making it more popular in China. About the year 2009, that was the first time there was a K1 Rules event in China. And I actually fought in the first um, K1 Rules fight in, in China. It was in Inner Mongolia. Not a great event, but it was an event. And there were a lot of China's top Sanda competitors there, like Bao Li Gao was there. Uh, Wang Guan was there. Um, Anyway, a bunch of Chinese Sunda champions, and they were fighting these international fighters, and I was there too. And um, this was a pivotal event in Chinese combat sports history because before that, before that, kickboxing matches were basically Sunda. It was professional Sunda. There was amateur Sunda, and then there was professional, which would take place in the boxing ring as opposed to on the Lei Tai that raised platform. But after that, man, all the kickboxing events started being K1 rules. 
I don't know if it was was specifically because of that one, or maybe it was Kunlun fight adopting the K1 rules or whatever, but pretty soon every kickboxing show in China, no longer Sanda, it was K1 rules. And so that big emphasis on throws and takedowns, gone. So again, there are about 10,000 people who train in Sanda in China right now. There are a lot more than that who do kickboxing, who do K1 style training. I would love to see a big resurgence of Sanda, but man, you would have to make it cooler. How do we make it cooler? We change the opinions of the public to get more people interested in it. So yeah, maybe if you had a, a Chinese Sanda fighter using Sanda in interesting and compelling and exciting ways, people would be like, hey, what, what is that all about? What kind of fight would that take? I mean, there, there are a few Chinese Sanda fighters in the UFC, like Wang Guan, the guy who put this, uh, this hole in my head right there. He's fighting in the UFC. He's an exciting fighter. He had a fight with Alex Caceres a while back. And it was a slugfest, man. It was uh, whew, a lot of crazy striking exchanges in that one. Fun fight to watch. I saw that one live. So Wang Guan, he's, he's a former national Chinese Sunda champion. And I would love to see him go farther in the sport. I'd love to see him get more fights in the UFC. There's probably a lot of politics involved in that. But is his style of fighting in the sport of MMA representational of Sunda? Um, I mean, it is and it isn't. Are we seeing all those cool Sunda throws? What is really interesting about Sunda, when you see a real master of it, a real Sunda Wong, that's a king of Sunda, what they're really good at is throwing people around and then just walking away. Do you remember Mark Hunt? Mark Hunt, famous for his walk away knockouts. Like he'll hit a guy and as they're falling down, he just walks away because he knows they're done. He is that confident. He's just the king of walk off knockouts. And it's amazing. People love him for it. One thing I think is incredibly cool when you have a high-level Sunda fighter is where he's able to just throw the guy and just walk away and be like, get up, let's do it again. Whereas in MMA, there's this big emphasis. We take people down. Why? Because we want to control them on the ground. We want to limit their ability to strike us. We want to limit their ability to damage us while we inflict damage on them. That's logical. That's a really good way to win fights. But is that always a way to get people to respond emotionally to a fight? Not always. A lot of people get bored with that. They're like, oh, this is, uh, this, this is boring. It's just guys hugging each other and rolling around on the ground. And that wouldn't work in the streets or whatever. It's a brilliant high percentage strategy to win an MMA. To win MMA fights. MMA, that's a tongue twister if you say it 10 times fast, and I just realized that. But what if, what if there was a prolific, talented Sanda fighter who knew how to fight on the ground too, but chose not to? What if there was a guy just throwing people and walking away and saying, get up? And then he threw him again and said, get up. And threw him again and said, get up. Let's do this again. I can beat you standing, I can beat you on the ground, but I choose to show you my grappling, but fight you with my striking. That's a powerful message. That's a powerful message that the audience can see, and that could shake things up, if that type of fighter existed, if there was a guy good enough to do that. You'd probably have to have a mismatch of skill sets in order to make that happen. Because if you had, you know, two guys who were just phenomenal wrestlers, yeah, you're not going to see one just tooling the other like that. If you have a guy who doesn't know how to wrestle and a guy who does, sure, that can happen. So you'd probably have to fix some fights. 
there are different ways to fix fights. It's not all, all about just uh, blatantly, obviously cheating. It's often matchmaking, fixing up different matchmakers. Man, I had a fight some time ago against a Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt. This was, man, over a, a decade ago, over a decade ago. And this guy's Brazilian jiu-jitsu grappling knowledge and ability was far beyond mine. This guy was a world champion grappler. And I was some guy coming from a kickboxing background, making that transition to MMA. And I was, as I was listening to the ring announcers, I noticed they were doing something. They were doing something. They were fixing the fight by training the audience in a narrative. They were telling the audience, what we are going to see is a matchup between a striker and a grappler. This fight was happening in Singapore, where um, at the time, MMA was fairly unknown. Most people hadn't seen it, weren't familiar with it. 1FC hadn't taken off yet. It was still martial combat, the predecessor of 1FC. And the ring announcers were training the audience and the narrative of the striker versus the grappler. Let's see what happens. They all knew what was going to happen. The grappler was going to take down the guy who wasn't nearly as good at grappling by a long shot and grapple him to death. But the audience didn't know that because they had been trained in the narrative of the movies, of kung fu movies, of people striking each other, and that's it. Boxing matches, maybe. Maybe they'd seen a kickboxing match or a Muay Thai fight, but not an MMA fight. They were essentially trying to do UFC 1 all over again. Here's the Hoist Gracie stand-in. Here's the Art Jimerson stand-in. Let's see what happens. And then people are like, whoa, jiu-jitsu is effective. Let's all learn jiu-jitsu and go over to uh, Evolve MMA, <laughs> where this coach is coaching and I believe was... Uh, one of the sponsors of the show, at the time anyway. Coincidence? Yeah, that was a great infomercial that they did. Martial Combat, the predecessor of 1FC. Great infomercial to try to promote grappling. And a very specific gym that did that. Not bitter, not bitter at all. That I was a pawn in their scheme, but yeah, anyway. But if you want to promote a specific style, a specific sport with a specific name, yeah, you're going to have to line up some pawns in a scheme, basically. As opposed to letting it happen organically, letting it happen naturally. Sundai is fun. I love it. I would love to see it be more popular worldwide. It is a great gateway drug to grappling. Because a lot of strikers are very, very reluctant to learn grappling. Muay Thai is also a great gateway drug to grappling. A lot of uh, women come into my gym and they say, I don't want to do any grappling. I want to learn kickboxing. I want to punch and kick things, and that's okay. If that's all you want to do, that's fine. But over time, generally speaking, if they stick with it, they want to learn more. They want to learn how to set up a knee. Then they start to gravitate toward clinch fighting and elbows and all this other stuff. And suddenly sweeps and takedowns are on the table. And once they start mastering sweeps and takedowns, they start asking questions. Well, what do I do with that takedown? Why am I taking them down? So you can beat them up on the floor, that's why. Somebody asked me what is the most glaring weakness of Muay Thai when transitioning to MMA, and that is pretending that the floor is lava. And the same holds true of Sunda, since there's no ground fighting. The floor is not lava, my friends. Why not just let fighting be fighting? Let fighting be the sport of fighting. I do enjoy, however, when you tweak the rules a little bit. Sometimes you can make it more fun to watch for certain people. People who like to see cool throws and takedowns. Sunda has them. People who like to see, you know, tie-ups and clinch fighting and short choppy elbows and very technical matches in the middle of the ring. 
Muay Thai has that. Cool. And if you like to see the sport of fighting, MMA has that. Thanks for watching. Now get out there and train.